Uh, we're back. We're live with Think Tech Energy in America. Uh, usually we talk to uh, Lou Pugliarisi wherever he is in the world, but we understand he is tonight uh, attending Samson and Delilah. Either that or he's playing Samson in Samson and Delilah. We're not sure. But in any event, we do have a show with EPRINT, the Energy Policy Research uh, Think Tank in Washington, uh, with its researcher in Mexico. It's really a global show, isn't it? Uh, Emily Medina. Emily Medina joins us from Mexico City. Hi, Emily. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. So, Emily, let's talk about, uh, you know, your area of specialty. Let's talk about Mexico. Let's talk about the economy in Mexico and how it's doing, because we know uh, that Mexico is heavily involved both ways, expo export and import uh, in oil and gas from the United States and uh, elsewhere. And uh, we want to find out how it's doing because we care about our partner to the south. We all care. Well, most of us care about our partner to the south. Can you talk about the economy in Mexico? Sure. Um, well, over the last year, we have seen um, a few changes in Mexico. First of all, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, Mexico's president, took office in late 2018. So we've seen already a year in his administration, and there's a lot of to talk about and what's been changing in Mexico. So there's a couple of things that are important to mention. So a year ago, AMLO had an approval rating of 85% in Mexico, which is huge. Yes. And um, he won um, with an overwhelming majority. Um, and Right now, his approval rating has gone down to 62%. So this is largely due to the fact that Mexico has seen an economic slowdown over the last year. Our economy had a technical recession in 2019, and today um, the outlook is, doesn't appear much better for 2020. And this is mainly due to um, the fact that he's taking a, a different uh, direction in terms of uh, Mexico's energy policy, mm. um, which um, is uh, basically um, saying or um, having a different view than what we had in the previous administration, which was a lot more open to foreign participation and AMLO um, actually um, has been very critical with the neoliberal model, and this has been reflected on Mexico's economy. Mm. And um, so, yeah. Well, I, you know, I just um, I wonder, uh, that's a pretty dramatic decrease in approval. Um, you think uh, the economy is the only issue? I mean, are, are people so focused on the economy and oil and gas that they would have this dramatic 20-point uh, drop in approval in only one year? Or there are other factors working, too, alongside uh, to make people uh, less enthusiastic about him? Yes. Um, two of the main factors have been um, that since he took office, he pledged on fighting corruption and reducing violence in the country. And those two things haven't been addressed fully. Um, we have um, a record of violence in the country. Um, the numbers have just been increasing since he took office in terms of homicide rates and feminicide uh, in the country is a big issue as well. Uh, and he hasn't responded in a way that um, makes us think that, one, he cares, or that he actually has a strategy to, um, to revert um, this um, violence rate. Mm. So those two issues have been um, very uh, and definitive on the approval rate. 
the issues that have to do with violence and corruption. So people um, really, I think, were very optimistic and hopeful that uh, the new president would fight uh, uh, cartels and, 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 and violent gangs in the country. And his strategy has not shown positive results mm. in terms of declining rates of violence. And oppositely, we see record numbers of of homicides in the country. But uh, is there any so suggestion? Is, is there any suggestion that he is uh, under the thumb of the of the gangs, uh, or is he just incompetent? I think uh, it mostly has to do with the strategy that he's he's been using. I mean, it it sounds almost I mean funny, but uh, he he said you know abrazos no balazos which basically means, I mean, he's going to uh, hug instead of um, shoot. So that's been his strategy. I mean, his, uh, based on, you know, being uh, nice to cartels, I mean, that, that doesn't work. I mean, you need to have uh, a, a good strategy um, to fight those types mm. of violent groups. Mm. And his strategy has not been uh, ideal. Now, when, you know, gang violence and corruption, gang violence and corruption, it's kind of like terrorism because it scares you because you don't know when it's coming to your town next. You don't know when your friends, relatives, associates are going to be gunned down or get involved in some unpleasant, uh, you know, gang activity. And so I can I can see that that would affect, um, you know, the way people think about the government. But let me let me offer uh, other uh, issues for you to uh, chime in on. Uh, for example, um, we, we still have the contention between uh, Mexico and, and the United States, the, uh, the migrant issue, uh, which is, oh, so tragic. Um, and it isn't resolved. I mean, if it is, please tell me. But I, don't, I haven't heard that it's resolved lately. Um, and I, I don't know the status of the wall. You hear all kinds of stories about the wall, how part of it blew down in a, in a wind and a breeze one day. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. And Trump is using money that was uh, supposed to be uh, for one thing and using it for another thing. And um, the whole thing seems to be a, a kind of confusion in the American uh, media. So I wonder how uh, people feel about the wall and the migrant issue and uh, those poor people who were camped outside and, and their daughters are molested and they starve and they get sick uh, in these forced camps that, that uh, Trump has created just on the south side of the American border. How does that affect the situation and the economy? No, what's been happening is pretty terrible. I mean, Mexico has become Trump's law. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's really um, uh, bad news for, for migrants because um, that means that uh, Mexican <coughs> authorities are now dealing more harshly um, with the migrants coming in. And this um, really uh, is uh, uh, human rights abuse, what we're seeing in several um, sev several migrant centers and, 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 and in points across the country where we have migrants coming in from Central America, for example. Um, from Guatemala and what have you, and at the border, we are seeing that the the Mexican authorities have been dealing with it in a pretty violent manner. Um, they've sprayed um, tear gas and and they've done you know um, uh, those types of uh, of things to to contain the the, pro the, the issue of of of, of, of migrant um, flows coming from. Central America and crossing throughout Mexico to get to the U.S. So, um, what happened is that um, you know before we had uh, the the government uh, basically, I mean, had a, a different understanding with the U.S. administration in terms of their treating of migrants, and right now the tone has escalated and. Uh, basically, and uh, Trump uh, uh, made sure that, that Mexico uh, 
took harsher measures and to address the migrant issue, and they haven't been addressed in a, in a orderly way because I don't know if it's because of a lack of resources or um, just the the lack of capacity to deal with this issue, but it's and, and their response and the way that they're dealing with it because of the pressure from the U.S. administration has been to just be a um, the Mexican wall. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, well, I you know I always pretty, think that at the bottom of all these uh, uh, diplomatic engagements or non engagements, there is there is the uh, <clears throat> human uh, psychology involved. And if I were uh, Mexico or, or if I were uh, Abrador, I would I would uh, the average Mexican person uh, would say, "Gee, we're really being victimized here. We have a president in the United States as opposed to." earlier presidents who just pushes us around something awful um, and he threatens us and he attacks us and and of course he has imposed tariffs on us and he calls the shots and, and we dance. And I think that, you know, if I were Mexico, what is Mexico has 80 million people, something along that line? Yeah, I, I, something along that line. Yeah. So uh, huge population. Yeah. If I were in Mexico, I'd be I'd be concerned that I was being taken advantage of and pushed around. And I think that that probably, you know, is something that, would, that focuses on the government. You know, why doesn't the government protect me? Why doesn't the government stand up to this man? Why doesn't the government, uh, you know, tell him he's off base? Uh, but it's very hard to do that, obviously, especially with Trump. And I imagine, you know, when you look at an economy, you are reflecting public confidence, confidence in the marketplace, confidence in the government, uh, confidence in the future. Um, confidence in your resources, uh, including human resources. So I suspect that, that that has to be a factor, too, that affects this uh, approval rating and that affects the economy. What do you think? Yes, I mean, um, he's been heavily criticized uh, for his strategy in dealing with the migrant issue in the country and his... Um, and his um, giving in to um, the Trump administration or the U.S. administration um, instead of, you know, um, of setting um, terms to combat the issue in a more um, holistic way. That's so, uh, um, Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, if we want to, I mean, and this is also going to affect our uh, security issues in the country because we have people coming in that are not being processed and correctly, and uh, this can create um, all um, sorts of um, repercussions. It costs you money. It costs you money for the administration or the migrants who come across your border from the south. Um, and it costs you, you know, the cost of administering the, in terms of human resources, government, government resources, and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, I, I was telling you before. And Mexico is a, is a it, Mexico has a responsibility, I think. Um, as, I mean, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest economies in Latin America, and I think it has the um, the resources to deal with this issue in a humanly way. Mm -hmm. And it's not doing so. Mm -hmm. I was telling you before the show that I saw an article or two about uh, how Mexico was, was turning more polyglot, uh, that it was entertaining migrants from elsewhere for, as permanent residents, as people who had, you know, uh, visas who could live in Mexico and form communities and get jobs and contribute to the economy. I, I don't know how people in Mexico see that, whether they like that or not. Um, but, uh, you know, just from an uh, observer point of view, it seems to me that it could be a very good thing, uh, you know, to uh, to allow immigration into Mexico to participate in, you know, in a better economy. How do you see that? How do, how do the people in Mexico see that? Well, uh, I think, I mean, a lot is going to have to do with the how issues are handled. So we need to have a plan to... I mean, if we're going to receive migrants, we need to have a plan to provide them uh, jobs and to also make sure that um, we have the security protocols in place 
so that the people that are coming in are coming in in a, in a good way, um, and that we have a plan. I mean, it's, it, in terms of, I mean, if we have the, with the current situation, I think it could be a problem to accept so many people and not have a plan. So, for example, our economy, you know, like I said, um, saw uh, a technical recession. I mean, this means that our employment rates are the lowest they have been in years. Mm. So if we, so that's going to be an issue, I think, um, if we don't have jobs for the people who are coming in. And even for the Mexican citizens, I mean, there, if we see this um, this unemployment rate, I mean, even Mexicans are having a problem getting jobs, you know? Uh, and a large part of uh, our economy depends on informal jobs. Uh, and we need to have um, a better uh, management of, in terms of providing maybe a, a we need to first, I mean, take the the, the, the uninformal jobs and, and bring them to so that they can be formal jobs mm -hmm. and increase our economy. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I mean, we can include, I mean, uh, migrants in, in, in the economy in that way. But first, we need to have um, a strengthening in the economy and we need to have uh, more investment so that people can actually have jobs. Yeah. Has, has investment changed uh, since Abrador got in, in office? Has investment changed since uh, Trump got in office? Uh, are you seeing the same sort of the same levels of foreign investment that you were seeing before? Um, well, that's, a, that's also been a huge issue. So just if we focus just on Mexico's energy sector, mm -hmm. um, we are seeing that investment has and decreased uh, over the last year. Uh, I mean, I since he took office. So this is because we have um, the mechanisms that we had in place to bring foreign investments are now imposed. So, and that specifically, what I mean with that is having the oil uh, rounds and the farm out um, closed to private investment. And this has been the government's decision. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, the reason for it, in terms of economically, it makes no sense. It's more of a, it has to do with this nationalist agenda of having the Mexican government and, uh, bring the uh, oil production up by itself. Mm -hmm. So his slogan or for Pemex when he took office was to rescue uh, Mexico's energy sector and to rescue um, the state-owned oil company, Petróleos Mexicanos. And this has been contrary to what we've seen. We have Pemex with a uh, record um, of losses. Just in 2019, um, the losses were about 19 or eight, well, uh, to round it up, it would be 19 billion, but it's actually $18.4 billion loss in 2019, which is the highest loss that we've seen in Pemex um, historically. It's actually nearly double the loss that we saw in the previous year. Is this because uh, the price of oil has gone down? <laughs> We're in a time now when the price of oil is not necessarily going up. It sometimes goes down. Maybe it's a long-term trend to go down. And is this because, is, is the loss in Pemex uh, due to the fact that oil energy prices are going down on a global market? Yeah, it, it has to do um, with a series of, of things. So yeah, like you said, um, the price of oil hasn't helped. Um, our food export um, sales declined because of this, um, and also because of the decrease in oil output coming from Pemex, mm -hmm. which was about seven percent per year. What about the? So uh... There's two factors. I mean, having a, a decline in production. You know, we're seeing a seven percent decline in Pemex production which is uh, today 
1.6 million barrels of oil per day. Um, so we see a decline in production, and we also see um, reduced oil exports because of it, and also reduced sales, uh, revenue from sales because of the decline in, in oil price. So all of those factors have to do with um, the panic losses. And also, um, a huge issue has been that um, the government um, has been um, very uh, serious about investing on Mexico's refineries. So that doesn't help the, the picture because mm-hmm. uh, we know that downstream has um, uh, more reduced margins than investing in exploration and production activities. So when we have six refineries that are operating at one third of their capacity, and we're and we're still pouring money into them, um, we lose the opportunity of investing in other projects that are more profitable, like exploration and production. Mm-hmm. And if we also have um, a cancellation or uh, a stop, however you may call it, to the oil around and the farm out then we have, you know, the, the opportunity to capture that important investment that would help um, bring our production up and help our economy, um, then we are in trouble. Well, you might be in more trouble, actually, Emily, because we have the, we have the, uh, the virus. And uh, I don't know if there are a significant <laughs> number of cases of the virus in Mexico these days, uh, but I would imagine that most, most places on the planet are at risk um, and my question is, uh, you know, if we have, and we probably will have, a global downturn here, uh, whether you call it an epidemic or a pandemic or an endemic, um, this is probably going to affect travel, it's probably going to affect trade, it's probably going to affect you know, the economies of most of the countries, uh, you know, uh, that, are, that are at the top of the heap, and maybe some at the bottom too. Um, so that's got to affect Mexico too. So if I give you uh, in the next year um, a reduction in global economic activity because of this, what happens to Mexico, especially in view of the fact that Mexico is already uh, in a bit of a downturn from other causes? Yeah, it's unfortunate that we're um, seeing, I mean, this issue with the virus at the same time that we are struggling with our economy. And so, yeah, we're starting um, in the wrong foot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and I think the, the, the virus, I mean, it's going to definitely have um, an impact on, on, on crude exports in Mexico as the oil demand globally declines. And this is going to, you know, impact our economy. And we need to, to find ways to, I mean, to provide certainty and provide uh, the mechanisms that allow um, investment to come into the country. Mm. So we have, uh, so um, a big issue, and I think what's um, also affecting um, economic growth in Mexico has been um, the increasing uncertainty coming from the government, where, um, just for an example, um, we were expected to have an energy plan for infrastructure investment in the country in mid-February, and still there's not a plan in place. Uh, so, I mean, if we don't have an um, option for private investment to participate, then um, it's hard to expect the economy to grow. Mm-hmm. What about the uh, other aspect of the virus? Have you got cases of coronavirus in Mexico? Are people afraid of coronavirus uh, in Mexico? Are they slowing down their economic and work activity because of it? Well, I, I believe we have about five cases of coronavirus throughout the country. Um, they've been uh, contained and they're um, being handled. Um, People did panic over the coronavirus and, you know, the stocks for um, face masks and antibacterials um, ran out in many stores because of panic uh, uh, sales and 
So uh, in terms of how we address this issue, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, there's been increase in communication on the effects of the coronavirus and how to treat it and what have you. So, I mean, Mexico is, is pretty uh, far away from where the virus is. I mean, um, it, I, I don't think it's going to be a, a huge issue in Mexico. Mm. Well, given all of that, given all that we've talked about in the, in the past few minutes, uh, if I made you the president of Mexico, Emily, and I'm, I'm inclined to do that, actually, um, what would you do now to improve the economy, to improve Mexico's position in world trade, um, Mexico's ability to, uh, you know, uh, uh, develop its resources and so forth? What would you do? I would provide certainty for investment. I would open the channels that allow foreign direct investment and Mexico, I mean, and, and domestic investment. Right now, um, companies, Mexican and foreign companies, um, don't have the certainty to put their money in Mexico because of the, the signals that's been coming from the government, yeah. which are basically um, to be energy sovereign. And, you know, I mean, those types of messages don't um, provide certainty and for private participants to and increase their investments in the country. And I think and that affects um, the Mexican population in general as we um, are going to continue seeing our production decline um, and we're going to see, you know, increased energy prices because of the lack of investment in exploration and production activities that are much needed to um, reverse this trend. Well, Emily, let me, let me say that... Uh... You, you represent, I think, the future of Mexico, and I, I will vote for you uh, as the president as soon as I get a chance. <laughs> but I also, feel, I also feel that Mexico is, uh, you know, Mexico, Canada, they're our best friends, Mexico. We're bonded to Mexico. We have so many Mexicans and Latin Americans in this country. Uh, we, we are inextricably intertwined with Mexico, and we should have a much more robust relationship with you, and we should help you in every way we can because you can be, um, you know, our best friend south of the border. And I would like to see that. And I hope the next administration can actually have that happen. In any event, that's, uh, that's Emily uh, Medina. Uh, she's from EPRINC, the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington. And she has joined us from Mexico City by a VMIX call. And we are delighted to talk to her at all times. And I hope we talk to you again, Emily. I really appreciate you coming down. Thank you, Dave. Aloha. Vaya con Dios. Ha, 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 ha.